weekend of the 24th and the 25th for a great time of impartation and equipping, also connecting with other men from our, our nationwide branches of churches. I'm looking forward to all that God is going to be doing. As the ushers come, I would like to take the Lord's offering. Giving is how we are able to do what's most important to God here tonight. When obedient believers uh, like you and I uh, give of our resources, um, partnering with our pastor and uh, for the kingdom of God, I want to tell you, uh, God uh, will begin to look over you and help and undertake uh, on you and I's behalf. Because God, uh, you can never outgive God here tonight. Let's look at it uh, as, an, as an investment uh, into the kingdom of God. Remember that the tithe belongs to the Lord, uh, offerings besides and pledges. Um, and watch God do amazing things uh, in your life, brother. And Kosnati, please pray over the offering. Amen, churches, we give blessing the song we lift him. Say, I will praise him. I will praise your name, oh Lord. I will sing about your mercy. You deserve the highest place. Be exalted here. As we begin to pray, lift him higher, let our praise and sing wonders of his love. Lift him higher, oh, lift him higher, lift him higher, let our praise and sing wonders of his love. Lift him higher, oh, one more time, lift him higher, lift him higher. Let our praise and sing wonders of His love. Lift Him higher; He deserves the glory. Thank you, musicians. God bless your ministry. If you have your Bibles uh, with you tonight, you can turn with me to Job 31. We're going to force Pastor Shannon to take a test. We're going to put both of the twins up. And if he can't call him by the right name, he gets no check. So, man, Job 31. I just want to add my welcome. Uh, tomorrow night, the practice, a clarification, that the drama, that is for the twice dead drama. If Ashton or Jabu has spoken to you about that, that's the practice that's tomorrow uh, at 630. So keep that in mind. Amen. Job 31, you can turn there with me. One of the fascinating things about uh, the modern world, in my opinion, is awards shows. You know, we have movie awards, we have TV awards, we have all these uh, things. But what's interesting is for people who actually earn awards, like athletes, people that do stuff, there's no awards shows. Right? Because if an athlete wins, they give him the trophy, and what does he do? He goes home and keeps practicing. That's what he does. That's why he won. But people like actors, can we be real? What are they winning awards for? Hey, you pretended to be Bob. Great job. I, I, don't, I don't understand, but there's shows. But what's interesting is what you'll never find in an awards show is an honest acceptance speech, will you? Right? They'll say things like, oh, you know, I want to thank all the people. You know, they'll, they'll give some lip service, all the people. that. But then they'll say, but, you know, it was a lot of hard work, you know, and we really, you know, I, man, I was practicing hard to pretend to be Bob. Man, it was hard. <laughs> but, you know, they won't say honest things like, I want to, you know, just give thanks that, you know, I was born into a rich family. Because <laughs> that's how you become an actor. You didn't know that? Sorry. Hate to burst your bubble. It's not going to happen for you. Right, I, I want to just thank, you know, my rich daddy who, you know, got me that scholarship in that fancy acting school. And my rich uncle who knows the guy at the studio that got me the job. You never hear honesty in those things. It's always taking credit for things that they didn't do. Now, we live in a world where that's pretty much an, an epidemic. Everyone is taking credit for things they didn't do. We take credit for all the good things that happen in our life. Of course, we don't take credit for any of the bad stuff that happens. That was your fault, right? 
All the good stuff, I did it. All the bad stuff, you did it. It's an interesting scripture we're going to read tonight. Job is defending himself, and one of the things that he says in his defense of his character is he basically says, I didn't take credit for this, because that would be a sin. I want to talk this evening about the need for giving God proper credit in life. Job 31, you can read with me beginning in verse 24. This is Job, of course, he's answering an accusation. He says, if I have made gold my hope or said to find gold, you are my confidence. If I've rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gained much, if I have observed the sun when it shines or the moon in brightness so that my heart had been enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity Deserving of judgment, for I would have denied God who is above. I want to preach a message tonight called, Who Did It? In this scripture, Job makes this statement, If I have kissed my hand, this is a picture of an Eastern uh, truth. In many Eastern religions, they will worship anything that blesses them, including their own hand. If you do a good job, you literally will worship the tools you used or even your hands. Let's talk about this uh, this evening. Who did it? First, we need to consider the necessity of effort in life. A truth about life is it always requires human effort. All the way back to the garden, it required our involvement. Man had a job, Genesis 2, 15. We were put in the garden to keep it, Genesis 1, 28. He said, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, God gave blessing, but man had to be involved. This is true in practical work. You know, uh, one of the things that you discover in life, uh, depending on your family, it'll be earlier or later, but we all discover it, and it's the horrifying reality, and that is that unless you work, you're going to be broke. You know, we haven't all discovered that, but we all will eventually, right? Right? We have, you know, when you're a kid, when you grow up, it's magic, right? You wake up in the morning, and breakfast is there. You have no idea where that comes from. Right, But mom and dad were working for that. See, this is true in all of life. You must work uh, in order to get ahead. This is actually the dilemma of uh, most employers in the world. Everybody wants a paycheck, but not everybody wants to work. Right, But this is true in relationships as well. Colossians 3, 12 and 13. Therefore, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If you're going to have healthy relationships, they will also require work. I was counseling a man one time and challenging him about his marriage. And he said, but pastor, you don't understand. You got lucky. So what do you mean? You got blessed with a good marriage. Bro, let me tell you, we have put some work into this. Yes, I have a good marriage, but it is stinking hard work. There was no magic uh, miracle that happened in the beginning where suddenly we were just nice and kind. Actually, Rachel was pretty much always like that, but I wasn't. It took work. So that's natural life. It requires human effort, but this is also true in your spiritual life. Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is a fundamental truth about serving God, is that it will require your effort and your involvement. Think about your prayer life. A prayer life doesn't just happen. It comes from work. Everyone in this room, I'm willing to bet, Uh, With very few exceptions, we have all desired to have a good prayer life. Is that true? You know, you hear preaching on prayer, you think, man, I need to pray, right? I'm going to do it, right? And then what? (laughs) And then morning comes, doesn't it? And the old saying goes, morning comes early. (laughs) And and, And some of you have developed a very healthy prayer life, but it took a lot of work, didn't it? It didn't just happen. It's not a decision you make. Okay, you know, abracadabra, I have a prayer life. It takes work. It takes discipline and effort. Even Jesus said to his disciples, could you not pray with me one hour? Some people can even get to prayer. It still takes work to pray. Some people sit in prayer, and this is what they do. 
that maybe they're sleeping, maybe they're meditating. Sometimes they open their Bible in front of them to pretend like they're reading it. And they're just sitting there. If prayer is work, some people, they just put their mouth on autopilot. They'll speak in tongues for three hours. That's not prayer. Come on, man. Put some effort into this. Think about some words and say them. So it takes work. If you're going to read the Bible, it's going to take work. Fruitfulness takes work. There's labor that's involved. Listen, fruitfulness is always the result of effort. There's evangelism and follow-up and laboring for new converts. If you're going to get supernatural breakthrough, it requires personal effort. 2 Samuel 5 is the story. David goes up against the Philistines. He asks God for advice. God says, go up and I will help you. God gives them a victory and David calls it the place of breakthrough but listen even though it was a miracle God did the miracle David still fought the battle nobody in this room has any idea what it's like to fight a medieval battle think about this David they're out there with swords come on now right and you know swords you know you see in movies they're like whoa, whoa, whoa. that's not happening in real life have you ever picked up a real sword like in a museum? Right? All you tough guys be like, Aah! think about we're talking about effort and labor. There's energy expended even when it's a miracle breakthrough. So the natural result, of course, when we put effort in, is sometimes or many times we get good results. This is good. That's why we fight for things, because it's worth it. If you discipline your body, you can be healthy. It's wonderful. If you invest in your marriage, you can have a good marriage. If you are wise with your finances, you can be blessed. If you labor for the kingdom, you can see fruitfulness. This is what Job did. He was a good man. He did the right things, and he saw good results. So let's talk then about the danger of taking too much credit. Because in our scripture, this is what Job is saying. He's, he's answering uh, an accusation, and his defense is, I didn't take too much credit, or I didn't take credit for what God did. Verse 24, if I made gold my hope, or said to gold, you are my confidence. Verse uh, 27, so that my heart had been enticed, and my mouth kissed my hand. Again, this is an Eastern form of worship, uh, an Eastern sign, uh, in some religions, the practice was um, that if you were going to worship an idol, you would actually kiss your hand and throw it to the idol. But Job is actually saying, I didn't even make my hand my idol. You know, it was like, Mwah. good job, Job. Come on. I know we're all a little bit like that sometimes, right? You think, man, you did good. Man, you're all right, Heimberg. Right, you look in the mirror, look at you. Man, you're out here kicking butt, right? Just Your life is going good for you. Job says, I didn't do that. He says, I was careful to never worship or literally to take credit for the things that God has done. Listen, if we take credit, number one, Job says this is sin. In verse 28, this would be iniquity deserving of judgment. This word iniquity means sin or wickedness or wrongdoing. In the publishing world, we call this plagiarism, right? There's a long history of people who lose everything because they stole credit. In 2012 to 2020, Ryan Broderick he was a senior journalist at uh, BuzzFeed. This is a, a very large organization in the U.S. They're an umbrella company. They oversee some of the most popular uh, internet publishing in North America. This was a prominent position. He made great money. He made headlines. He was just a well-known writer until in June of 2020, they discovered that he didn't write most of the stuff he said he wrote. He stole it from other people. He would actually go online and he would find, because uh, it's a tech uh, publishing company, he'd find tech blogs that weren't very popular, and he would literally copy and paste it and say, look what I wrote. So this is a crime. He lost everything, lost his high-powered career because he took credit for something he didn't do. The key issue, of course, is that this is dishonest. 
If we take credit for everything good that happens in our lives, we are ignoring the God factor in our success. Right? God is the one who brings the results when we labor. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 and 6. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. He's talking about in ministry. He's saying, listen, even though I'm the one here working, I don't get the credit. It's interesting. You talk to pastors, uh, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of language. We talk about my convert. All right, we do this in the church, don't we? Sometimes we like to brag, right, when you bring a visitor to church. Hey, hey, stick with me. Sit by me, bro. I want pastor to see you came with me, man. It's my convert. You know, in Prescott, you have to understand, Prescott, now it's kind of a, it's grown, it's more metropolitan, but it was a pretty small town uh, when I was growing up being discipled. And very uh, plain. We'd, in America, we'd say it's white bread town, right? It's mostly people that look like me, right? Then we begin to have, you know, some Hispanic immigration. Only in the last few years do you really see anyone of any serious color in, in Prescott, right? Now it's, it's kind of... And so listen, if you ever prayed with anyone who looked the slightest bit different, and there was like a trophy... Oh, please come to church. Man, I don't care if you're black or brown. I don't care if you got pink, spiky hair, whatever, right? P please come sit with me, right? Because it's my convert. But Paul, the greatest apostle and missionary, says, I don't get credit for this. I planted, someone else watered, but God gave the increase. Even inside of us, as we develop, it is God who deserves the credit. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. He's saying, I don't even get credit for my own development. It's God working in me. So when we are taking too much credit, it is a fundamentally dishonest view of life. So, but this goes further. When we take credit for good, we actually dethrone God, don't we? In verse 28, he says, this would be iniquity deserving of judgment, for I would have denied God who is above. You know, you hear this sometimes in the way people talk about their successes. Man, I had this great idea. Really, it was you. It was only you. God wasn't involved. And then I, you guys aren't hearing me. I, I read this great book about marriage. Oh, man, yeah, you know, it was a mirror. It was great. Oh, I had this great outreach idea. I heard one man in conference. This is no joke. In conference, he's giving, you know, we have people give reports and he's, he's you know, he, he's no longer a pastor any longer. You'll discover why in just a couple of seconds. <laughs> and he's like, you know, we were having this issue and then I preached this tremendous sermon about, you know, whatever the, you know, <laughs> homeboy's saying that to the Prescott conference, right? It's like all the leaders of the fellowship, right? He's been preaching for like four and a half weeks or something. I don't, you know. Really, you did that, huh? Wow, you did it all. But see, this is actually denying God, isn't it? The danger is we begin to believe what we're saying. Well, I did this, and then I did that. And well, you know, I started praying extra long, and then I started reading the Bible more than everyone else, and then I did this. And, and, and the problem is, is we begin to believe that it's actually us. And I believe that this is what Job is talking about. As he's defending himself, he's saying, I'm not like these people that take credit for everything. I am careful to let God get the credit. But listen, ultimately... If you take all the credit, you're going to end up very discouraged in life. You know, the reality is that sometimes things go bad, very bad, right? Isn't that what Job's story is all about? I mean, it really doesn't get much worse than Job's life. So if you are the one that's responsible for everything, what happens when life goes bad? Now, I know we try to cast blame elsewhere, but the reality is if you're the one that believes you're responsible, 
you will live with lifelong depression for every bad thing that happens. Every difficulty in life is going to be a personal blow, a a setback on the inside that you can't survive. And so uh, this is the great dilemma. If you are the one responsible for your success, what do you do when things go bad? Bill Gates said, success is a lousy teacher. It seduces smart people into thinking they can't lose. And that's the dilemma. Because when things are going good, we love to take the credit and we make ourselves the star of the show. And then we just don't know what to do when things go bad. And I've counseled people in my ministry that this is what destroys them, is that they can't process setbacks because everything is viewed as a personal failure. You know, sometimes things go bad and it's nobody's fault. You know, that's true in life. And sometimes life just stinks. Right? I mean, I I know about 90% of the time we can blame ESCOM. But sometimes, (laughs) sometimes it's nobody's fault. Right? But the problem is, if you are the type that takes credit, you take everything personal. Right? Pastor, what did I do wrong? Where did I go astray? What is it in my life? And ultimately becomes a statement of personal failure or a statement about your lack of worth and value before God. So let's talk then finally about a proper perspective of effort. We have to have a righteous perspective of our own labor. 1 Corinthians 3.9 says, For we are fellow workers with God. The point is, we are partners with God in everything that we do. Whether that's in natural life or in ministry. In the natural realm, you can plant a seed, but it is the miracle mystery of growth that brings a crop. In other words, it's you and God working together. In the spiritual realm, you can labor for souls. You can invest in your spiritual life, but it is God that brings them in. It is God that converts them. And so So yes, your labor is important. You will never grow without labor. You'll never progress in life without your own work. But listen, more important than labor is perspective. And perspective tells us that it is God that is working with us to accomplish His will in our lives. And so the crucial action in this is that we must intentionally exalt God. In all that we do, we need to make a focus of glorifying God with our efforts. We need to intentionally exalt Him uh, in light of the results. In Acts 14, there's the story about Paul and Barnabas. And uh, after this miracle is performed, uh, they begin to say they're gods. They begin to uh, tell, that's a pretty good day, huh? (laughs) They're gods. Oh my gosh. And so, but what what do they do? They run in among them. It says they're tearing their clothes. No, we're not. And it says they were scarcely able to restrain them from sacrificing to them. Listen, you've never had a day that good where people were literally about to sacrifice an animal to you because they believe you're God. But this is the decision they made. They, They said, you know what? We are going to make a point about this. So listen, while you and I will never be in that circumstance, we really do like taking the credit, don't we? And, and may, you know, not, you know, over the top, but, you know, we like to take maybe just a little more than we should. <laughs> we were working on this sermon. I was telling the guys this story, but uh, years ago, uh, I, I forget now, it's been too many years, it's fuzzy, but one of the pastors was telling a story about, uh, you know, after uh, there was like a lady who sang a special song, and, and he said, you know, that, sister, that was really good. That was really nice, you know. And you know what's worse than pride is false humility. Because you know what false humility is, is it is naked pride. That's what it is. And she's like, oh, it was all God. He said, it wasn't that good. (laughs) Uh, You know what? There must be something in us that intentionally glorifies God. I'm not talking about some weird super spirituality, you know, some weird religious thing. But listen, in life, this is the proper response. God gets the credit. 
Yes, I'm here. I'm putting in the hours. I get it. I actually had to type this sermon. God didn't do it for me. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, Lord, we're ready. The computer's on. But God is the one working. Listen, if I ever have something smart to say, trust me, it didn't come out of this little brain. Right? I'm not smart enough to figure that out. But this is crucial in life that that is our perspective. God is the one. In your personal life, your blessing comes from God. Favor comes from God. It's not your savvy. It's not your relational skills. Oh, I'm just so smart. Pastor, let me tell you what I did. I was negotiating, and you know, I learned a few tricks. You know, And it, listen, it's not you. Bro, it's God. He's helping you. In your marriage, yes, you put in the effort, but God is the one that created marriage. God is the one that gave you your spouse, even our sanity. What little of it there might be. I'm not, I'm not making eye contact with anyone. I'm not trying to... It's because God has helped us. You know, this is the point of worship, isn't it? A lot of people misunderstand worship. They think that the song service, the worship service, that's like the landing zone to make sure that you get here before the preaching, right? Because we can't just be like, all right, 7 o'clock, start preaching, and some people will be late. So they, well, let's sing some songs, you know, and then that'll give people the, that's not why we do it, right? It's also not, you know, to give the musicians time to practice. Worship is an intentional act of enthroning God. Psalm 22 says he is enthroned in our praises. Think about what worship is. Worship is getting proper perspective. We're saying, God, you are God and I'm not. So this is what God says. When you give God credit, which is what worship is, it puts him on the throne. That is how we put God on the throne is by letting him take credit for the things that he does. Let's make it more personal. Your worship, your personal worship is how you determine that God sits on the throne of your heart and not you. That is why it's crucial that you worship. One of the things I love is just hearing people worship. Hearing, and I don't care if you can sing good. I, listen, I don't matter to me if you can clap on beat. I don't care a lick. I just want to see people worship. One of the things that hurts my head sometimes is you be in church and there's people there, there's loving God. They don't even know the words of the song. Have you ever had that happen to you? You're singing a church song for years and then you see the words, oh, those are the words. <laughs> right? You don't even know what you're saying. Right? Who's Harold, right? And why are the angels talking about him, right? <laughs> some of you just got some revelation. But you look out in church and, there, and there's people, they are just loving God. And then these people are just kind of like, what are you doing? I tell you, this is how we put God on the throne, is through our worship. So this is an intentional act. We are making sure that God sits on the throne. But what our scripture tells us is that God blesses those who don't steal his credit. In our scripture, Job is the ultimate example he refused to take credit for all the blessing that God gave him. Verse 27, again, his defense, I did not uh, kiss my hand is what he's saying. I didn't take credit for anything. In fact, if you read the whole book of Job continually, he says God has given, God can take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, this isn't up to me. This is all up to God. And the end result is God blesses Job twice as much as he was before, gives him far more than he ever had. Here is the clear message for you and I tonight. While our labor is crucial, while our investment is definitely needed uh, in both the kingdom and in our personal lives, at the end of the day, God is the one who blesses and God is the one who deserves all the credit. And I'll close with this scripture, Jeremiah 9. 23 and 24, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this. Let him glory that he understands me and that he knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness, for in these I delight. God says you can be 
wise, you can be mighty, you can be rich, but let your glory be that you know God. And God says, those are the kind of people I delight in. Let's bow our heads together. Thank God. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed just for a few minutes. In a moment, we're going to change this service, but before we do, if you are not a born-again Christian tonight, you really need to be. The Bible says we've all sinned. We all come short of God's glory. None of us is righteous, not a single one. And the scripture tells us the penalty for our sin is death. Talking about not just the death of the body, but the condemnation of our soul. But the promise of Jesus Christ is that if you believe in him, if you turn from your sin and ask him to forgive you, he will, and he'll wash away the stain of your sin, and he gives the promise of eternal life with him. So right now, while our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, you're here, and you be honest. You're not a born-again Christian. Maybe you're a backslider, but you want to be right with God. Put your hand up all across this place. You're unsaved. Or your back's and raise your hand. Amen. I see this hand. How many others would there be? You're not right with God, but you want to be. I see this hand. How many more? I see this one. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you lifted your hand, I want you to come. Come kneel down right here, here, there in the back. Come. I need a few men to come pray. Praise God. Lead them in a prayer of repentance. Thank you, Jesus. Christians in this place, I preach very simple tonight. Maybe God is dealing with you about what I preached or something else entirely. I want to give you time to pray in this altar. Let's stand to our feet. Amen. You come pray. Talk to God. If you see someone and you're not sure if they're saved, witness to them. Invite them to know Jesus. And we'll sing a song while these are praying. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. God, minister in your grace and your favor. Jesus, pour out your grace, minister in your people. God, I'm asking for supernatural help and favor. Jesus, minister in your help and in your favor. All the joy. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Sing, cast me not away. Yes, thank you, Lord Jesus. Take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me all the joy and renew our spirit. 
Amen. Let's worship God together. Thank you, Jesus. Sharananda Rabba Karananda Rabba Sidi Orodosai. God, I love you and thank you for your grace. Thank you for your favor. Praise God. We're going to be dismissed in a moment. Take some time tonight. Greet someone. Show yourself friendly. Remember all that's happening this weekend. Let's bow our heads together as we're about to be dismissed. Uh, I wonder if Cajiso would lift his voice and dismiss us in prayer.